Hey guys, so today we're going to do quite an intensive coding tutorial, it's going to be a long one, um, and particularly we're going to take a ResNet model, publicly available, and we're going to quantize it entirely from scratch. So for those of you who are new to the channel, my name is Oscar Sabalainen, I do a lot of AI stuff, particularly a lot of neural network quantization stuff, uh, because that's what I'm, I'm specialized in. and. Yeah, like if you haven't seen my previous videos, they, they've covered a lot of theory on quantization, what it means to quantize, what happens on hardware when we quantize, what are the different kinds of quantization. Uh, but today is going to be our first real uh, coding tutorial, and I think it's actually the first of its kind, where we're going to take a model and we're just going to quantize it entirely from scratch. So I'm pretty excited, hopefully you are excited. Uh, and so yeah, uh, a few things to say is that we're going to be using eager mode quantization, for those of you who don't know, there's a, a bunch of different quantization frameworks inside of PyTorch. There's eager mode, then there's FX graph mode, and there's export mode. And FX graph mode and export mode, they're, they're very similar. And they both work on the graph, and they're very much part of the like PyTorch 2.0 ecosystem that works on the graph, on the DAG, the, the directed acyclic graph. Um, but today we're going to be covering eager mode. And as I said, it's quite a long coding tutorial, and I, I think that speaks to, you're gonna see how labor intensive eager mode can be, but I think it's important to understand. I think a lot of legacy quantization code is eager mode. I think to this day, probably most people still use eager mode. Um, but eager mode has some pitfalls, and we're gonna discover them today. And then also we're gonna be doing static quantization-ish. Uh, because again, for those of you who don't know, there's static quantization and there's dynamic quantization. And in static quantization, the quantization parameters are fixed during inference for both weights and activations. But in dynamic quantization, they're fixed for weight, but they are inferred during runtime for activations. Um, and so I say we're doing static quantization-ish because we are going through all of the uh, code for static quantization, and that's what we're going to be doing. But you'll see when we get to the section that our static quantization parameters are perfect for our specific case, which is kind of reminiscent of dynamic quantization. But we'll see more when we get there. And then also just to say that all of the code from today's tutorial is available on my GitHub. If you get stuck at any point, absolutely uh, use it as a reference, but I do highly recommend you follow along because I think to learn quantization, you should do quantization. And I think there is a long, uh, there's a strong coding aspect to quantization. So I think it's important to get the practice in. And then, um, oh yeah, and also we're gonna, we're gonna, there's, there'll be bugs. There's, we're gonna discover and squash some really nasty bugs in this tutorial. So I highly recommend you follow along for the full experience. And then last thing to say is that if you have any comments, feedback, questions, uh, leave a, a comment or an issue on GitHub, reach out to me on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. If you find this useful, please do like and subscribe. It, it helps and all of those things. And yeah, without further ado, let's get into the tutorial. So we're going to take this ResNet model from PyTorch Vision, Torch Vision, and we're going to quantize it. And this is a brief tutorial about how you can take a ResNet and see how it's working. So we're going to do that. And then if we go to GitHub, what we're going to do, we're just going to take the ResNet model definition and we're going to combine it with this tutorial and then we're just going to quantize it, yeah? So if we, we're just literally gonna copy paste this entire ResNet model. I'm gonna go copy. Copy paste this all, but I'm just gonna do it like this. Cool. So this is going to be our ResNet model that we're going to work with now because I literally just copied the GitHub model definition for this. There's going to be a bunch of stuff that isn't going to work because of these relative imports. And we're going to initialize this. Now this should not actually work. So we're going to try this. Okay, cool. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about with the relative imports which means we're going to have to change this. Now, this is going to be pretty easy to change, especially because I have Torch Vision installed. Okay, and then we get this error. An entry is already registered under the name Resna18. This error is just a function of special decorator that's in this file. So this register model. 
and we don't actually want to do that. Okay, so cool. That worked. So we're just going to print model. Cool. So this is what the ResNet looks like. So we printed out the entire model, and we can see there as a conv layer, batch norm layer, relu, max pool, and then it has these kind of layer sequential blocks, which will contain conv, batch norm, relu, and then there's occasionally be these down samples as well. So, okay, how do we quantize this? Well, in my previous video, I talked about the theory on how to quantize things. So there are a few things we need to do. Step one, I can write architecture changes namely one stubs slash load functionals. Step two is use modules. This is not necessary, but it is highly recommended. For all of the reasons I outlined before, step three, assign and queue configs. These are the quantization ingredients on how you actually quantize a model prepare or let's say fake quant and then step five convert true intake model okay so hopefully you've seen my previous video and you understand the theory of all of this i'm not going to go into the theory of all of this now but these are the steps we're going to go through so we're going to start with the easiest thing which is just placing quant stubs So if we look at the structure of this code for a little bit, we've initialized this ResNet 18 as our model. It's loaded the weights and it calls this ResNet, which initializes this model. And then again, it just initializes ResNet and then it'll load the weights if we gave the weights, which we did. And here, what we're going to want to do is put preacher and true, just so we make sure that we actually do load in the weights. And then, yeah, so we initialize this model, we load the weights, and then this ResNet is here. And then basically what this is going to do is that it's gonna have a conv, a bash norm, a relu, and then it's gonna have all of these sequential layer blocks that calls this make layer function. And this make layer function or method is just going to create like a bunch of these sequential blocks, depending on you know what model we want. Like for ResNet 18, it's going to look like this basically. Okay, but where is the forward call of this? So if we're in this ResNet call, so we have our forward call, which is going to call this forward implicit. And really, there's no reason we shouldn't just wrap this. So generally speaking, if you want to quantize the entire model, like we do in this case, we'll put a quant stub at the very beginning of the forward pass and a dequant stub at the very end. So as soon as a, a tensor gets fed in, it gets quantized, everything inside in between those quant and dequant stubs will be in quantized space and then the dequant stub will hit and it'll be converted back to floating point. So we're just going to do this, self quant x, x equals do do do. And then x. Now normally, I'm personally not the biggest fan of just naming every variable the same variable like inputs and outputs i think it makes debugging harder than it needs to be frankly but just keeping with this convention and making minimalist changes i'm just going to, to keep it this way but generally speaking i do prefer to actually name things different okay and then here we're just going to initialize our font stubs so this is going to be actually i might just give the whole name for this And then we're going to initialize our dequant stubs in just the same way. And then that should be all kosher. So we have quant stubs, we have a forward call, and then we have our dequant stubs. So that was nice and convenient. Okay, so we've done this. What about flow functionals? I'm actually gonna leave this for now because I want to show what happens if you don't have flow functionals. And this example will come up. For now, we're gonna write done. Step two is to fuse modules. This is going to be a bit messy. So, as I mentioned in the theory video, there's two ways to fuse modules. One is using naming, and the other one is using a graph-based tracing method that's available in PyTorch 2.0. Currently, I'm not using PyTorch 2.0, 
I'm just going to use the standard naming method for fusing modules. And you will come to understand why it is pretty painful to do and why using a name based method to fuse modules is actually super brittle. Okay, so we are going to fuse the modules with the function that PyTorch provides. So we will go to AO quantization fuse modules. This takes in two arguments. It takes in the model and it takes in a list of lists of modules to fuse. There are actually two versions of this function. One, which is just fuse modules, and then there's fuse modules QAT. They do slightly different things. We will talk about uh, the differences between them later, but for now we will be using the fuse modules QAT. Then we have to produce this list of lists of modules to fuse. The way we're going to do this is that we are going to use a model method to fuse and we're going to have to create this method. The reason we're going to use a method is just it's going to be a bit more robust because say for example we in the future want to change the number of sequential blocks, not that we will, but if we did, uh, using a method is just going to be a bit more robust because we can exploit information from inside of the model and it'll make a, a way to automate creating this list of lists of modules to fuse that much more generalizable and easy to use. So generally I would recommend using methods for this kind of thing. So next we are going to create this uh, method so that we can generate this list of lists. So first off, when we look at the actual forward function, we see these uh, conv bash on relu, those should be fused. And then inside of each of the layers, we should fuse things as well. And then the layers, if we look at, it'll be this block type, uh, we see that inside ResNet is just these basic blocks. Yeah, basic blocks. Occasionally these down samples, which are a sequential. This is what we will be working with. So I am actually going to delete this bottleneck class because that never gets used. And then I'll have to delete that there. I mean, it's kind of awkward to have a union there. So I'm just going to delete this as well. And this is just for typing. This shouldn't cause any problems. Let's just check. Bottleneck is not defined. I'll show it up again. Let's see if this shows up anywhere else. Cool. All right, so we have to create this modules to fuse, but just first let's look at these layers. So inside these basic blocks, how are the layers structured? Okay, so we have a conv, a batch norm, a relu, and then a conv and a batch norm. Okay, so that's gonna be pretty easy. So we need to fuse these, we need to fuse these inside of the layers, but we're gonna start at the highest, we're gonna start at the highest level. So we're going to create this method. Oops. Left fuse. What did I call it? I called it modules to fuse and it's going to take in nothing for now. And I'm going to create this list. I'm actually going to give it this name to distinguish it from the method. Then what are we going to do? Okay, so we're going to start with just fusing these. So this is going to be pretty easy. Modules to use equals append, well, I think extend rather. And then it's just, and literally we're just calling it by the layers names, right? And you can probably already get some intuition as to how brittle this is going to be, because if someone changes the names of one of these, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because they won't fuse. And just due to the nature of fusing, because it's an optional step and not a mandatory step, like it will fail silently. So this can actually be a massive pain in intakes. And this is just something that we have to live with when we're doing these name based conventions for fusing modules. So if and when you are dealing with this fusing method with name using the naming method, you have to be really strict in how the layers in your module are actually called. Like you have to enforce this. You have to make sure that other people, when they change the code, they're respecting the fact that the modules are going to get fused. So it is just a thing that needs to be enforced. But 
yeah, it's it's pain, frankly. Like it's it's not fun. But yeah, that's that's kind of what we have to live with. Okay, and then we're going to do we're gonna iterate through layers. So we're gonna say mm, or layer in layer. And I'm actually trying to figure out exactly how I'm going to do this. This could be potentially slightly awkward. I think I might need an evaluation, like an eval method in this. Which is... Oh, actually, I could just do this. This is better. Or you could even do, like, name the modules if layer in name, for example, and that would be a bit more generalizable to the number of layers, but, you know, this will work. And, yep, and then we're going to call equals... Should we feed it in? Probably. Uh, or... We're going to feed the modules to use. Hmm. And so this is going to be another method that we're also going to have to create within the... Was it the basic block class? So modules to fuse, should this take in? I think I'll, will I? Yeah, okay, we're gonna try this. Um, we can always change our minds later. Stand. Dang, that should work. Yeah, modules to fuse. And then at the end of this entire thing, we're going to return. Cool. We're going to have these basic blocks and then we're just going to implement the same kind of method. But it's going to be customized. I don't know since we're here already. Cool, but I'll return this. Okay, so we initialize the list. Okay, so the purpose of this method is inside of the basic block, we're going to just basically fuse these. So if we have a down sample, we're going to fuse the layers in the down sample, which is a conv and a batch norm. Otherwise, these conv, batch norm, relu, we're going to fuse these, we're going to fuse these. And yeah, that's all there really is to it. There's nothing that complicated. So modules. Extend, and we are going to do one, additional one. Wait. That's number one. This is number two. And then if self down sample, so we can presumably just copy this. And then what happens inside the down sample? I don't quite remember what the down samples look like. Okay, so it's a sequential and they don't have names, it's just a zero and a one index. Actually, so are these blocks. Okay, yeah, this is gonna be slightly irritating. You, you can you can see I'm I am not in love with the name-based fusing methods. But okay, let's try this. And the thing is this actually has to take in a prefix as well, because I will show you why. So the reason this has to take in a prefix is because we actually have to add prefixes to all of these. Because if you if you just have a layer, like for example, if we're fusing things inside of this basic block, we can't just give the list as comp one b one relu because that's going to get confused with the higher level or the kind of the original comp one b one relu. Like it has to have the naming convention of, for example, layer one. 0 conv one b one relu So these all have to take prefixes that is, you know, going to tell us basically what block we're inside of. So these all have to be... F strings. And then while we're here, what are we going to call these prefixes? Um, hmm. And this prefix is going to be... So what was it? It was layer one, so the name of it, basically. Okay, so we're gonna do enumerate. Hmm, 
but it's a, it's a one, not a zero. Oh, this is kind of irritating. Okay. I might have to go back to what I had originally. Uh, so, treating these as strings. And then we're going to say layer, let's just layer string, and then that should do it actually. And then the layer is going to have to be eval to self. Sorry, that is completely wrong. I think that is correct. And just for the sake of um, enforcing this convention, we're using single string, single quotes. Okay, so I think this is correct. So we have self layer one, that's going to give us this layer module. It's going to call this. And generally speaking, eval methods, like it's not good coding practice, but you know, frankly, as neither is a name-based convention for fusing modules, like this also is not good coding practice. So in for a penny, in for a pound. And this is the kind of stuff that you sometimes have to deal with when you're doing intakes, and particularly like when you're building your model architectures, you should build them in a way that's going to make it easy to quantize. This is not particularly easy to quantize. This is just a ResNet. It was not designed to be quantized when they coded this up, but you know where th this is why I'm making this tutorial, just so you can see that any arbitrary network, we're going to figure out how to quantize it. Cool. So the, this should all work. And if not, we will debug in due time. Okay, so it takes some prefix. Cool, 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 cool. And that's, for example, layer one it has the sequential as well. So it's not as simple as it just being, it also has these blocks. Okay. Maybe we, how do we do? Maybe we do it within each layer. As you can see, I'm already not in love with this, but we're gonna do full block number in range length layer. That should work, I presume, since it's sequential. And then prefix equals f. And in case this isn't obvious why I'm doing this, the reason is because each of these layers, uh, for example, layer two, it's not just a, a basic block immediately, it's going to be a sequential wrapper around two basic blocks, so zero and one, and so we have to add this to the full name so that, you know, when we're actually accessing which layers we want to fuse, it's going to be the correct path to it. And then this has to be prefix. And I'm sorry, this is like completely tedious to watch, but hopefully if you're following along, this is going to help explain why we're doing this. Okay, so fuse those, come to batch norm two, that's all good, if self downsample, and the downsample was a sequential as well, so we're going to do modules to fuse, extend, and then what is going, this going to be, this is going to be a conf, I think it might just be a zero actually, uh, well, the downsample is called this. So downsample zero and downsample one, I presume, is going to work. Cool. Now, I never hope that these things are going to work the very first time I run them. Even though I have coded this up separately, right? Like I have actually gone through this. I have built this tutorial before, but this time I'm coding it from scratch. Uh, so, if it works, which it didn't, it would be surprising. Okay, so layer... Ah, I think this will work. Block number. And it takes three. Ah, so there should be a list of three. Uh, 
it should be because it's a list of lists that we have to feed in so like this will be a list that we feed in saying that we should fuse these this will be a list saying we should fuse those all to create our fantastic list of lists Jeez, what is this okay we are going to make sure i did this correctly Actually, you know what? I'm going to use IPython instead. I feel like it's more convenient for what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's the problem. Okay, so that's extended. I probably want to append, actually. Do I? Because I don't want it to just be one list. Hmm. I think I want that one to be an append, and I don't want this one to be an extend. Although I could be wrong. Uh, I'm going to copy this so I don't have to do this again. Okay, this looks more correct. So we have, these are gonna get fused together, which is correct, layer zero conv. I think this is correct, as in this is layer one, it's the first sequential, as in it's the first block in the sequential, so zero. Those get fused, then it's the second block in the sequential, so these get fused. Layer two has a down sample as well. Is it just in the first block? Okay, yeah, so the down sample is in the first block. That looks good. There's no down sample in the second block. So that looks fine because we don't see a layer 2.1 down sample. We just see a 2.0 down sample. I think... I hesitate to say this, but I think this might actually be correct. Okay. Park that there for now. And then we can see... what this actually fused model looks like. Actually, I should park this all the way at the end so that I don't have to keep doing it. Now let's look at what the model looks like now. Okay, it looks very different, which is cool. So this is what the fusing does, essentially. Like, whereas previously we had conv batch norm, Relu. Now we have this conv batch norm relu object, which is just a sequential wrapper around the conv 2D, the batch norm, and the relu. But that is pretty cool. So this is, and all of the batch norms and the relus got set to identity. The max pools are on touch because we didn't fuse those because fusing for these is not supported. And then we can see that inside these basic blocks and the sequentials, this all seems to have happened correctly. The batch norms are identity, the relus are identity, and we have these instead of a conv, now we have this conv batch norm relu 2D. Cool. Okay. Yeah, this all looks good and correct. For the down sample, that's been turned into a conv batch norm, and what was previously the batch norm has been turned into an identity. All right, cool. Yeah, I mean, this, this all looks correct. And that's what we want to see from the fusing anyway. All right, awesome. Okay, yeah, so this all looks correct. And let's keep in mind that what I use, I use this fuels modules QAT method. Now, there's two methods for fusing things. There are, again, there's, there's graph-based methods, but as far as the naming methods are concerned, there's fuse modules QAT and fuse modules uh, without QAT. So what this does, in, in the example of a batch norm, for example, it will, 
keep the batch on. So that if you're training in, in QAT, what it's going to do is that it's actually going to update the batch room statistics. And this will uh, fuse batch norm, shall we say, weights into the preceding conf. So I'm just going to show you what happens if we just use the normal not QAT fusing method. So previously when we used the fusing method, we got these conf batch norm relu 2D instances. Fusion only for eval. This is something that can happen as well. So before you do the fusing, just set your model to eval mode. And yeah, just welcome to Intel. Like honestly, like coding wise, it has a pretty steep learning curve. So these are just the kind of things that we have to get used to. So now if I print the model, whereas previously how we had those conv batch norm relu 2D layers, now we just have conv relu 2D. We see that the batch norm still got set to an identity layer, but what ended up happening is that the batch norm weight got fused into the conv weight. So now essentially, there's no longer this batch norm layer inside of here, it's just a conv relu 2D. And whatever adjustments the batch norm layer was going to do to the conv have been fused in. So this is kind of a static now. So if we took this model and we trained it, it wouldn't be doing batch norm anymore, it would just be running as a normal conv relu 2D layer. So in a sense, the batch norm is now static. So that's something to be aware of. If you want to keep updating the batch norm, we use this fuse modules QAT. So I'm going to use this for now and we will see what ends up happening downstream and um, what some of the problems with this is. Hey guys, so I have interrupted this tutorial briefly to say that the first time I filmed this tutorial was maybe like three months ago, four months ago. And as I was editing this video, I was kind of like, you know what? I don't really like how I did that. I don't feel like it's the best representation of, of static quantization or, you know, the Qconfigs in particular. In the original video, I used the default Qconfigs. I am not a fan of the default Qconfigs. They are kind of confusing. And I will have a separate video on that just to keep this video shorter on the default Qconfigs and why I think you shouldn't use them. But I, I want this video to be as like high quality as possible. So I, I'm, I'm refilming this entire second half of this, of this tutorial from scratch. So yeah, without further ado, let's, let's get into it. Okay. So yeah, we're just gonna continue where we left off, which is assigning the Qconfigs and we will be building our own. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to import from torch.ao quantization, fake quantize, import fake quantize. This is one of Torch's quantization modules. Torch has a bunch of different options. I would say that there's four main ones. There's fake quantize, there's fixed Q params fake quantize, there's a fused version, and then there's learnable fake quantize. These quantization modules do slightly different things. Fixed Q params fake quantize means that your Q params will always be fixed. They will never change. They cannot change. They're set at initialization and they, they remain that way forever. Fake quantize is only updatable via PTQ. You can't learn them. They're not learnable like in, in QAT. They're just, they're only observed. Yeah. And then there's learnable fake quantize, which is you can do PTQ, you can also do QAT, you can learn them by gradient descent if need be. And fused is something that I, I personally don't use, it's just kind of like a slightly optimized version of fake quantize. It's, it does away with some of the kind of branching inefficiencies in the forward call, but that doesn't really matter. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna build this this Q config. So we're going to something to know about the Q config is that you have to assign both the weight and the activation. Activation Q config equals torch fake quantize with args. Cool. Uh -huh. Equals and this observer is going to be our PTQ observer. So we have many different options here. Kind of the defaults to go to for activations is the histogram observer, which can be a bit slow depending on how much uh, PTQ information you have, but it generally does have the best performance. So what the histogram of the observer does is that it, as you're feeding data through your model in PTQ, it's observing the activations and it's storing kind of a, a history of all of these activations into a histogram. And the histogram is dynamically gonna grow and kind of dynamically figure out its bins. And then what it's going to do is that it's gonna pick Q params so as to minimize the MSC between those two things. 
So that's what the observer does. And here we need to specify our quant min, quant max. This is just going to be like what our quantization range is in terms of the integer space. So we have D type, which is going to be forge Q it's eight, I believe. And then Q scheme. And this is the kind of quantization that we want. Yeah, so we want torch per tensor affine, and then that should be that. This should all be correct, and I think that will live. If not, we will come back to it. So we have the weight gigantic is going to be very much the same, and in fact, we're going to copy basically that entire thing. Okay, so that is our activation qconfig. We use a histogram observer, and for our weight qconfig, we're going to do something slightly different. Generally speaking, you're not going to need a, a histogram observer for this. Generally, what people use is a per channel min-max observer. And that just means that because for weights, where we're quite lucky is that typically for activations, we need to do per tensor activized for quantization. But for weights, we can actually do per channel quantization, which is kind of cool. And particularly for weights, we tend to do symmetric quantization. This is for a number of reasons. One, because symmetric quantization is much faster. There's an NVIDIA white paper that kind of goes into this which is very informative as to as to why you do symmetric quantization. But the, the long story is weights you want to symmetrically quantize just because of uh, speed, you know, it's, it's much better. And weights tend to be symmetrically um, distributed around zero anyway. Uh, occasionally they won't be if you have some special weight tensor that you've kind of manually configured, then yeah, you might have to use affine quantization. But generally speaking, if you can use symmetric quantization, in terms of D-type, where symmetric, we're not gonna have unsigned weight tensors because we have negative values and we have positive values so this this needs to be signed in terms of quant max because we have um, symmetric quantization this isn't going to be zero to two five five on our integer grid it's actually be going to be one two seven or rather it will be minus one two eight to one two seven and then that should all work and the choice of fake quantizer of other observers like learnable fake quantizer or fixed cube rounds fake quantizer was kind of arbitrary i just kind of wanted to show how it works so we will then construct qconfig, which looks like this, and it's just, it takes in a tuple, a named tuple of activation equals whatever our activation qconfig is. And you can see that there's probably a lot of combinations that one can build, so one can get kind of creative with the whatever composition one uses. Wait, qconfig, cool. And then last thing is, model that you can pick equals you can pick and it's that simple so we've assigned we've created this q config that we wanted for these layers and then we've assigned model.q config now you could get way more granular with this you could have a, a million different q configs and you could say model.com1 equals q config equals uh, qconfig1 model and then the first block of the resnet could have its own q config and whatever But we'll talk about this more in the next step, which is we are going to prepare. Oh, actually, this shouldn't be a model, should it? It should be fused model. Because we went through all of that hard work confusing our, our layers. It would be a shame if we just didn't take any advantage of that. Fake quant model is torch.ao quantization repair QAT. Now, it's very important that we use prepare QAT and not prepare. This is a bug that can catch people up sometimes. There is a function called prepare and this, and it will run. It will run successfully. It just won't do what you want it to do. So you need to use prepare QAT. This is, this is very important. And I also think that this needs to be in train mode before it runs, before we can, we can convert it to fake quant. Okay, let's see if this all went correctly. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to mention, but as I, I wanted to redo this to start from scratch, the, the folder structure is slightly different. This should be exactly where we left off, but just to say that, you know, this, this looks different. Oh, that seemed to all go. Great, yeah, this is what we want to see. So we're going to look at this linear layer, 
And this got, and I'm going to talk more about this prepare QAT instruction in a second, and we're going to go into the documentation because I think it's useful to understand what's happening under the hood just to see what this fake one model looks like. It looks, it looks beautiful. So we have this linear layer and it has these new attributes that have been added. We have this weight fake quant, which is responsible for quantizing the weights. And that in itself has a bunch of different attributes. It has this fake quant enabled, which means are we doing, are we going to quantize the tensor or not? We have observer enabled, which is on. Zero means off, one means on. And these are both on. And observer enabled is just the PTQ. Are we doing PTQ or not? This is our quant min, our quant max. And this kind of tells us, yeah, okay, per channel symmetric, this is what we want. And these are our Q params. We have scale and we have zero point. And then what's interesting is that we have the activation, and this hasn't been initialized. These should actually grow because we're going to do per channel uh, quantization. So this will actually have as many values or the, the tensor will be as large as there are the output channels and then the activation post process is the ptq observer for the weight fake quant the name and convention is slightly confusing so yeah weight fake quant is the quantization module for the weights but activation post process of weight fake quant is the ptq observer for the weight and as we said we said we wanted per channel min max observer which is what we can see here and then for the activations, i.e. the output feature of this, in this case, a linear layer, we have the same thing. We have all of the same attributes, but here we have per tensor quantization, which is what you need for, for activations, typically speaking. And yeah, we can see that it also has this PTQ observer, you know, activation post-process of activation post-process. And in our case, it's a histogram observer. We can see it just has the default values. No data has been fed through this module. So we actually haven't done PTQ yet and we haven't observed anything. And so these Q prams are completely initialized. And the Q prams, yeah, they're just set at the default values of scale one, 0.0, .0 the same thing for the weights. But yeah, we should be we should be proud. Like if you've you've gotten this far, you've you've successfully created a fake quant model. So yeah, and okay, we're now going to dive into what is happening under the hood of prepare QAT because I think it is useful to understand. Okay, and in case this is useful, this is just the, the quantization module that we were referring to earlier, the fake quantize. I'm just showing this briefly just so you know it. But yeah, there's a bunch of stuff going on here where we like set the quant min, quant max. You know, it's it's just kind of boilerplate building stuff. But the forward call is kind of interesting is that here we do PTQ if a burger is enabled. This is us doing PTQ. It calls activation post process on the detached incoming tensor. From it, it's kind of funny how this works is that it then calls calculate Q params, which you know accesses activation post process, the PTQ observer to derive these, and then it kind of copies the data from the PTQ observer, the scale and the zero points as calculated by the PTQ observer. It copies them into the quantization modules scale and zero point. So this code is like a little bit, it, once you know what it's doing, it's, it's fairly simple, but like at first view, it might be a bit confusing. And then this is the fake quant enabled. So this is if we, when we actually quantize the tensor, if it's per channel, we do fake quantization uh, per channel. If it's per tensor, we do per tensor. And this is just a call to the C, uh, the C++ backend at the end of the day. But yeah, we don't, we don't need to talk more about that. I just wanted to show it. So. This is the prepare QAT function, which does the preparation where it takes a floating point model and it converts it to a fake quant model. This is, I think, important to understand because it, it does three main things. So the first thing that it does is that it does propagate qconfig. And earlier where, you know, we just assigned model.qconfig equals qconfig, the reason we can do that is because of this line of code is that what it does is that for every module that has a qconfig attached to it, for all of its sub modules and kind of children modules, it will uh, propagate that qconfig down to those sub modules. So it's, it's really useful. So like if you, you know, just send model.qconfig, all of the modules in your model are going to have that same qconfig. Uh, but if you want to intervene and be like, okay, I want uh, this specific sub module to have this very special qconfig, it will do so. And then all of that's that submodule, submodules will have that, that qconfig. So it's quite useful. Convert is very important. Convert, it basically swaps out the, the module types and the modules themselves for other kinds of modules that are fake quantizable. And this is kind of important to understand. We'll, we'll dig into this a little bit later and we'll look at what the mapping is. And then prepare, this does a lot of stuff where like it adds hooks basically onto like activation post-process. It'll add in the observers. 
it'll, you know, because, yeah, like a, a lot of quantization is done via hooks, and this prepare call is what's doing all of those hooks. So if you didn't call prepare QAT and you just call prepare, you'd get all of the hooks, but it wouldn't propagate the Q configs, it wouldn't do the conversion properly. Um, so, yeah, like it, it's important to call prepare QAT and not just prepare. But let's look uh, a little bit at this conversion function because I think this is, is, is good to understand. The mapping gets called, it's via this default QAT module mappings, which ultimately is defined over here. And it, it calls a function, which ultimately calls this, like if I show you, yeah, def get default QAT module mappings, which is the function that we just called. It calls default QAT module mappings, which is a dict. And this is basically on the left-hand side are all of the modules that you have. These are like fused modules that we just created by fusing. And then it will swap those modules out for these other modules, like NNI, QAT, Convolu 2D. And if we go look at what, an example of one of those modules, this is the fused Convolu 1D that is fake quantizable. And what we see is that the really interesting part about this is that it, first of all, it's fused. So we can see that it does this com forward, then it does this relu because it's a com relu. But I think the, the thing that's key to see here is that it wraps the call to the weight tensor with this weight fake quant call, which was, is going to quantize the weight. And the reason this is important, because if you don't do this conversion, you won't actually quantize your weight, because the way that they quantize weight is by literally having a separate module that exists for this reason, that wraps the call to the weight tensor. Activations you can get away with, because that's just done with adding hooks, so you can do that on any arbitrary module that you want to. But if you want to be able to quantize weights, you do need to... I mean, the way PyTorch has implemented it is that you wrap the call to the weight tensor with this weight fake quant. So I just wanted to highlight that. I think it's good knowledge to have that that's what's happening under under the hood. But anyway, we can we can go back to our code. Okay, so we have this fake quantized module. Now is probably a good time to to do two things. One, we want to evaluate this and make sure that it's it's all going well. And then also simultaneously, we're gonna cheat a little bit and we're gonna do PTQ as we do evaluate. But yeah, so we're just gonna build a little evaluation function and this is gonna be super simple. It's actually just gonna steal it straight up from the ResNet tutorial. So yeah, we will build that and I will have to build the evaluate function, but that will work soon. Evaluate model and then we're just gonna actually yank that. So it'll be diffused model. And this evaluation is important to make sure that nothing has gone wrong and uh, not to, to foreshadow it, but something has actually gone wrong. Uh, there is a bug hidden in here uh, that we will have to will have to debug. And then that will be used more fake one. Then we're going to create an evaluate. And as I said, we're just going to go to the original ResNet tutorial and we're literally just going to take, because they have an entire section on how to how to kind of run the ResNet and how to see how it does. So we're just going to steal all of this. So we're literally going to copy paste that over. So we grab that. And we copy it over to our ImageNet classes. So yeah. It's as easy as that. And then for this, we just kind of wrap it in a function. So def evaluate a model. And I've added this device string with default for CUDA. And this is something I personally don't need. Like on my laptop currently, I don't actually have an NVIDIA GPU, so I don't have CUDA. But presuming that other people do, I'm gonna make this code more, more generalist. And so that is going to involve deleting this and then replacing it with, with this. And so what this does is that if you specify that you're on CPU, it will have all of your inputs and your model on CPU. And if you specify CUDA, it will put everything on CUDA. But we'll see that this might be important depending on whatever your hardware is. So yeah, that is our evaluation function done. Hopefully that was clear. And if not, please reach out, leave a, leave a question or a comment or whatever. Okay, so now let's check out how this is done. And I foreshadow you that, that there is an issue here. We, we have introduced the bug. Oh, check CUDA is available. Oh yeah, sorry, that's because I actually don't have CUDA by default. So I'm going to... Let's 
set the old CPU. But if you have CUDA, by all means, you know, set it to, set it to CUDA if you, if you so wish. CPU should be fine, but if you want to have uh, CUDA, you can do so. And I'm actually going to go to the top of this and I'm going to comment this out because I don't think we need this anymore. Okay, so something interesting has happened, which is, why, why is it printing? Oh, okay, in our evaluate function, we're printing a bunch of stuff that we probably don't need to print. Print output and print probabilities. Okay, so we're not gonna print that out. We're only gonna print out the top five predictions of uh, what this Res metal, ResNet model thinks uh, the input image is. And yeah, for full context, the input image is this uh, nice doggo. It is technically a Samoyed. And yeah, we're gonna see how well the ResNet is able to classify this image. So that should be a bit more clear now. And we're gonna see how the model does in float, infused, and in fake quant. And in this fake quant, we're cheating a little bit because we have PTQ enabled. So we're kind of doing like, dynamic quantization in a sense. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so something has, I mean, the flow model is fine. It, it predicts that this is a Samoyed. Um, look at this little handsome man. It is It is a Samoyed, so good job float model. The problem is the, the fused model, <laughs> which uh, predicts that it's a cock, as in like a male chicken. And uh, you know, it's very certain of this and it's adamant that it's not a goldfish or a tiger shark. So something has definitely gone wrong in our fusing and we will discover what this bug is together. But I think this is actually very, very important. And this is a good example of what's gone wrong in fusing. So and we're just going to fast forward to where the bug is. And this is one of those problems with eager mode quantization. And I don't think graph mode has the same problem. But we're going to dig into this example and see what went wrong. So here we were fusing conv1, batch norm1, and relu. And then we fused uh, conv2 and batch norm2 together, and then downsample0 and downsample1 together, which is just a, a conv and a batch norm. And so this is what the forward call looks like. Now, I highly, highly recommend you take a couple minutes and you try to figure out what went wrong here. Because people often do this when they're building their forward calls, and it's very common in, in floating point, but it's not good for quantization and it's not good for fusing. So, you know, pause the video, try to figure out what the issue is, but, you know, I'm going to give the answer now. Which is that the problem is this reloop. So it got fused in the conv1 batch norm1 relu, and then the batch norm1 and the relu got sent to identity. Now, the problem is that that same relu gets reused at the end. And the reason it's reused is because relus are stateless. So you should be allowed to do this. It shouldn't matter. But when you're fusing, this actually got fused into that. So this got set to identity, which means that there's no relu on the output of this model, which means that it's just a fundamentally different model. And that's why when we do fusing, we get very, very bad results. So we need to we need to fix this. And the, the super simple thing to do is to just in, initialize this differently, right? Like, so we're going to just call this redo out and we're going to call this one, just for the sake of kind of consistency, we're gonna call this redo one. We're gonna make sure that we uh, use it correctly. And then uh, we need to initialize it again. And then this one has to get renamed uh, relu1, there we go. Okay, so now that should all work because now these relus are distinct and this is something I highly recommend. Wherever you have modules, you should think in terms of quantization that you, you probably should initialize a separate module for each, particularly like relus and any kind of activations that you, you can consider stateless, but it's important. The only exception I'd make to this is like dequant stubs because dequant stubs are entirely stateless. They're fine for quantization. You can reuse the same dequant stub as much as you want. It's not an issue. And if you know that you want the module to be the same, let's say you have a quant stub and it deals with like image tensors, which always have fixed QPRAMs, you know, you can just reuse the same quant stub as much as you want. But generally speaking, you should initialize things separately. And I, I would recommend against using like functional APIs, for example because those are also common, but they're not modules, they're not usable, unless you're in graph mode, in which case they are. But uh, yeah, generally speaking, good proper quantization kind of habit is to initialize things separately. Now we're gonna check this out and look at that. Now the fused model works. So yeah, I mean, hopefully this 
this puts some fear into you of ego mode quantization and when you're fusing things, how things can go wrong and about how you should think about, okay, when you're architecting your model, what is a good way of doing things. The fake one model actually does super well as well. Again, we are slightly cheating here because we're doing PTQ as we run this. So it's, it's kind of doing dynamic quantization. It's not really static quantization. And so actually we're going to So yeah, we can see that the fake quant model does quite well, but yeah, we are slightly cheating because this is more a form of dynamic quantization than static quantization, because as we were feeding data through the fake quant model, the observers were turned on. Um, and so they were the quantization parameters were basically perfect for the given image tensor, at least as far as the observers were able to make it so. And then the question is, okay, well, if we want to do this as a proper static quantization, how should we do so? Well. We're going to do it, but we're going to do it with oops, with the caveat that it isn't actually going to be quite what we want it to be. So I am going to copy this and we're going to turn off the PTQ observer, but we should keep in mind that we're only feeding in one frame. Yeah, like basically we're feeding in one picture of a dog and then we our, uh, our observers are calibrated accordingly. And even if we turn the observers off, the quantization parameters were calibrated on the exact same frame that we're feeding in. So this isn't actually going to be a very good example of static quantization, but we're doing it anyway, because it's good to see how it happens. So the way that we're going to do this is that we're just going to apply the disable observer function, which is located actually in the same place as the quantization module is. If we go to torch AO quantization fake quantize, there is a function called disable observer, and that will in in turn call the method disable observer, which will, if appropriate, it will turn off all of the PTQ observers for all of the modules in the model once we apply model apply. So we are going to just do that really. Fake quantize, and I think it is disable observer. Why is this giving me error messages? Okay, we're gonna actually try this out just as is. Cool. And now if we go to any arbitrary layer, oh, oops, this is, this should be fake one model. And if we do the same here, cool. Now, if we look, yeah, we can see that observer enabled zero, which is great. And I will quickly show the documentation for this. Yeah, so here we can see these methods. So it's back where we were with the fake quantize module in the same file as it was described. Here at the bottom, we have a bunch of these functions, which as I said, they just call them, call them methods uh, associated with, with the fake quantize module. So we can disable fake quant if we want to, we can enable fake quant. And here we're using disable observer. So we're gonna look at what it's called uh, and it's defined in fake quantized base. Pretty sure. Yeah, so disable observer is just the flip side of enable observer. And we can see that all it does is it literally sets the buffer value equal to, in this case, zero when we disable. And we can see that, you know, the eventual effect that that has is when we do the forward call, if I can find it. Can I find it? I can find it. So if this is equal to zero, this entire process gets skipped and this entire process is the PTQ process. So we just don't do PTQ. Okay, so with that understanding, we're going to run this again. And we are going to see, I mean, the results should, the results should be exactly the same. This is, if this is like the perfect example for giving, or rather this is an example that will give you very good static quantization results because the quantization parameters were perfectly chosen as far as PTQ can perfectly choose quantization parameters for this very same example of this dog. So yeah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't celebrate too much that like we've, we've very efficiently quantized this network in static quantization. This, this isn't generalizable. Like if we feed in a picture of a tortoise, it's completely possible that we don't get nearly as good results in terms of classification. But here, yeah, we see that our, our, our pre-PTQ and our post-PTQ quantization is an exact match. That's normal because it's, it's literally the exact same input.
Okay, so we have one last thing to do, which is to go to our step five, which is um, convert the model. And this is our, like our true quantized model. And in this case, true int eight model, because we are doing eight bit quantization. Okay, and to convert the model, it's as simple as converted model equals torch AO quantization convert big quant model in place dot. And that is all that it should take. And then we're also going to do an evaluate. So print. model evaluate cool and so we're gonna we're gonna try run this and evaluate this and I warn you we kind of foreshadowed that there was going to be a bug at some point in the code and the bug I tell you now is is manifesting itself like this will throw an error. Yeah, here we go. We we get this massive trace back from the converted model when we try to evaluate it, and it's saying that it's it's basically very not happy. And the trace back is actually quite informative. So if we go down, it says that okay, this output, you know, this in place operation of adding the identity, it couldn't run it with the CPU's backend. It couldn't do add out. And this is kind of what we spoke about at the very beginning with flow functionals. This is the entire purpose why we need flow functionals is because we have a requantization step and the models just don't support these kind of add operations, especially not in place add operations. So we're going to need to replace this entire thing with a flow functional and we actually have an interesting uh, opportunity here because you have flow functionals and there's six uh, natively supported methods in PyTorch. There is add, mul, add scalar, mul scalar, add relu, and concat. And you should always use the flow functional that is most appropriate to your use case. In this case, uh, we have an add and we have a relu. So we can actually do away with this self relu output entirely and just replace the entire thing with uh, an add relu. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so out equals self and we can call this flow functional anything that we want to i'm going to call this self add add flow functional just for the sake of distinguishing it from the add redo method and we're going to add add and we're going to do identity and what this does is that it adds output and identity together and then it applies a redo and it is that simple and so we're going to replace this with uh, self dot add renew ff and this is going to be a flow functional so hold on oh this should be nn quantized flow functional and then that should all work and we say running and yeah here we go our converted model correctly worked it it produced the the output that we wanted to okay we have in this tutorial, we've taken a floating point model and we have transformed it all the way through a fake quantized model, all the way through to a converted model from scratch. So yeah, we should be you know pretty proud of what we've accomplished if you've followed along so far, but very well done. I want to show one last thing, which I think is going to be a bit informative. So just in terms of things that can go wrong. So we're going to look at something. For example, we're going to look at the scale. Okay, so the scale here of the converted model for the first conf layer is 0 0.08, 0 0.008, which is fine. And the reason it's this arbitrary value is because that's what it was in the fake quant model. If I go to activation post process and the scale, then we see it's equal to the exact same thing. It's equal to 0 0.0082. That's because it just copied the quantization parameters from the quake quant to the converted model. But I'm just going to show you, just because this can trip people up, and I, I don't want this to, to trip you up, what happens if we do the conversion here? And then we try to run this. So what we're going to see is that the converted model is actually going to do super poorly because 
it's going to copy over the initial Q params from the fake quant model, which is like a zero point of zero and a scale of one, because this is before we did PTQ on this model. So it's actually going to have like absolutely terrible performance, which is basically what the performance of the fake quant model would be if we never did PTQ on it. So in just I, I mentioned this just in case you ever have this bug and you're wondering why your converted model is, is doing very poorly. I'm going to have a, an entire separate video on why sometimes the fake one model is not equal to the converted model. But I just thought, since we're here now, I thought I would mention it. And yeah, here we see the digital, the, the converted model is doing very poorly. It thinks the, the picture of a dog is a digital clock. And if we look at the comp scale, yeah, it's equal to one instead of this uh, 0 0.008 value that it was before. But that is it. That is the entire tutorial. Uh, I hope you found it informative. Um, if you have any questions, please leave a comment or get in touch. Uh, the future tutorials, I swear, won't be this long. It's just that eager mode quantization, something from scratch all the way to a converted model. It is kind of a behemoth of an undertaking, especially when you have the squash bugs. Um, but all that to say, you know, great job following along uh, if you have. And yeah, like uh, I hope to see you in the next video. And I, I swear they will be easier from here on out. All right. See ya.